Uh, my name is Ann Swift Kayata. I'm the chair of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to this town council workshop, which is mostly on Fort Williams. We do have a second agenda item uh, later on in the meeting, which is a finance committee uh, review of the municipal budget. We're getting an update on that. But I realize probably that most people are here for the Fort Williams uh, topic. Fort Williams is a wonderful asset, which is owned by the people of Cape Elizabeth. It is a beautiful place, enjoyed by hundreds of thousands, we're not sure exactly how many, but many, many local citizens and visitors annually. The park's many operational and capital improvement needs are currently covered almost entirely by property taxes paid by Cape Elizabeth residents. Given all the financial needs of the park and the increasing strains on property taxpayers, in 2009 the Town Council asked the Citizen Volunteer Board known as the Fort Williams Advisory Commission to come up with a proposal to raise enough funds within Fort Williams to make it a financially self-sustaining entity. Last month the Fort Williams Advisory Commission sent us their recommendations including, which included vehicle parking fees and fees for buses visiting the park. I want to thank the Fort Williams Advisory Commission for all of their hard work in putting together their recommendations. And now a note on process. Over the next few months, the Town Council will be experimenting with the format of some of our meetings since one of our 2010 Town Council goals is to re-engineer town policy development processes to provide for increased and earlier citizen input on key decisions. Thus, tonight's workshop format will be televised and will be interactive with the meeting room audience. After a brief presentation from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission explaining their proposal, citizens, not just counselors, will be able to participate by asking questions and by giving input from the audience. So that the maximum number of people have a chance to participate, I ask that the speakers please uh, follow the following rules. Please give your name and address. Please be on point and brief. Try to keep your remarks under three minutes if you can. Please stand up when you speak so that everyone can hear. The acoustics in this room can be challenging sometimes, so that would be very helpful. Please limit your comments to general ideas if you can, not technical details. Those are not all worked out at this point uh, by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, by staff, or by the council. They will be worked out uh, if and when the council decides on what direction it will go with regard to fees at Fort Williams. And lastly, to facilitate the passing around of the microphone and the camera work, again, these are sort of technological limitations of this room, we're going to pass the one portable microphone that we have through each section of the audience, along each row of the audience. You can make a comment or you can pass. You don't have to say anything if you don't want to. But rather than skip around and be churning and, and making the uh, camera operator get motion sickness in the, in the back of the booth there, um, we thought it would be more effective to just go down the rows and um, after we go around the room there will be another pass around for anybody who was skipped so that they can have a chance to speak. Um, so everyone will have one, at least one chance to speak. Please don't take that second chance to speak again until everyone else has at least had one chance to speak. This is sort of an experiment tonight process wise so we'll see how it goes. Um, as far as the process goes and with the content. Tonight is the Town Council's first chance to review the Fort, William, Fort Williams Advisory Council's, uh, Commission's proposal. We do not have all the answers or maybe even all the questions tonight, but we want to get your input as soon in the decision-making process as possible. So we're all hearing it tonight at the same time, including TV watchers. The Council's plan is tonight to have an interactive workshop to get citizen input in questions. January 25th will be a town council work session which is open to the public but not a public forum or input session. And then the council hopes to vote on this issue at our February 8th town council meeting. 
That's our hope. We're not sure yet. We won't know until we've gone through the previous two meetings. In the meantime, I'm asking everybody who couldn't uh, come to this meeting, uh, if they have input, anybody who might be watching on TV, uh, if you have further input, we'd, we on the Council and the Advisory Commission would be happy to hear what you have to say. So we encourage you to send us emails or mail or give us a call, but frankly, email is probably the most efficient way to do that. Thank you very much. And I'm going to pass this along to Maureen McCarthy, who is the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, to outline their proposal. And I understand that Bill Nickerson is also going to be available to uh, help with that presentation. So, Maureen, thank you. And let me pass this down. Good evening. As Ann mentioned, on March 19th of 2009, Mike McGovern and then uh, the head of the council, Jim Rowe, came to our Fort Williams Advisory Commission meeting and um, did discuss funding for the fort and funding to become self-sustaining so that we would not be using um, taxpayer dollars to fund the fort. Um, he, Mike McGovern stated that uh, that he was planning on putting it in his budget me message and that the general opinion was that the fees would be used to within the fort. Um, in the past, the capital budget has been supported uh, by revenue from the picnic shelter, the coin-operated binoculars, uh, commercial site fees, as well as donations from the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. We've also received uh, funding from the Portland Headlight Group um, to do certain uh, projects at the fort, the extension of the cliff walk, the main gate, um, the new interpretive display that's been presented and some landscape improvements. Uh, revenue from the rental units that are in the fort have generally gone um, back to offset the operating budget and those are like utility expenses, portions of the salary for the park personnel. We, when we were working on this proposal, the 2010 um, budget was approximately $173,000. So that's kind of where we started our, our numbers game from. Um, in an effort to make some, some of these recommendations to the council, we utilized the Greater Portland Council of Governments to do a traffic study or counts and length of study, uh, length of stay study. Um, the information was used during our workshop to work on revenue projections for a pay and display fee model, which we felt would be the best method of instituting a fee. A pay and display meter is an automated parking meter that allows one meter for a general area in the fort or anywhere you're going to do a pay and display. Um, all customers parking in a specific area would utilize that meter to pay and then display the receipt in their vehicle dashboard. These meters accept coins, cash, and credit cards or debit cards. Um, we would need to reconfigure the old main gate um, entrance to eliminate parking and to allow emergency vehicles to have access um, to and from the fort. Um, in the report that we presented to the town council, it did discuss the need to travel, uh, to notify travel tour companies that we were going to be instituting a fee and that it would probably not be able to be instituted this year because they need a year notification. So that was also incorporated into our um, study. Um, we, the commission, feel strongly that the monies raised in the park should be dedicated to the park. There are several ongoing maintenance requirements that need attention and funding to bring the, fort, bring the park features up to date. There's lots of tree work, controlling invasive species, um, work on the pond, buildings, pathways, fields, picnic tables. Um, we have some other major projects that we've been discussing that we would like to have funding for. So as a result, once we become self-sustaining, any of the fees we feel should be left in the fort. Um, Bill Nickerson is going to come up now and talk about the actual uh, fee structure that we came up with. Thank you, Maureen. And good evening, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I have a lot of detail, and given the number of people who are here, I, I don't think I'm going to go into all the line items and how we 
arrived at it. So I'll just attempt to give an overall view of what our assumptions were and what we feel the fee generating capacity is. Um, first of all, the assumptions, and as Maureen mentioned, we use the Council of Governments, um, some of the interns there, to, to do a study. Now the study, by its nature, was very brief. It was 32 hours over four days, so you can um, understand it wasn't co that comprehensive, but at least it gave us more information than we've previously had about what the park, park traffic might um, amount to. And using that information, and for those of you who have the, the table, uh, we use table six in the, um, in the COG study. Um, we're, we're planning on charging fees seven months out of the year. And um, from April 1st to May 15th, and from October 1st to October 30th or 31st, we assumed 5,000 cars per week, which is about six, 60 cars an hour. Um, during the other 20 weeks, from the middle of May until the end of September, we projected 7,000 cars a week, and that's about 1,000 cars a day. It's 83 cars an hour over a 12-hour day, and that's exactly what um, this Table 6 refers to in the Council of Government study. We think that this is a reasonably conservative projection. Um, we're trying, given the fact that we don't have an awful lot of information, we felt it was better to start off using conservative numbers and numbers that specifically tie back to the Council of Government study, which, which gives uh, information about how long visitors stay, whether it's up to an hour, up to two hours all day. And so we could tie back into those numbers in putting together our fee schedule. Um, some other information that came out of that is that out-of-state residents uh, comprise about 28.5% of the total park visitors. Maine residents make up the other 71.5%, and Cape residents are comprise about 20% of total visitors, and that's something that came out of a public safety department survey. Um, so of the 100, we, we come up with 190,000 visits per year, um, and then have assumed that uh, we're gonna offer season passes, um, which would, for Cape residents, be $10, for the season and for uh, out-of-town residents would be $20. Part of the rationale for that is that the Cape has been supported, Cape taxpayers have been supporting the park uh, from the time it's been turned over until this time now, so um, there's an opportunity for us to get a little bit of a break um, given the amount that we've already put into maintaining it over the years. So we assume that 350 season passes would be sold to Cape residents, which represents 10% of the households. There are about 3,500 households in the town. And um, each one would have visited 15 times. Um, we just picked these numbers. And that we would choose, and that non-residents would purchase about 1,000 passes. Again, uh, they would have used the uh, park 15 times per year. So that subtracts uh, 20,250 visits out of the 190,000. And then we um, went through the hourly numbers that came, up, came out of the, the uh, COG survey. Um, at present, about 27% of um, visitors just drove through. They never stopped. They didn't park. And uh, we rose, we increased that to 33% or assuming that if people are having to pay, then some of those who would have stayed had they not had to pay uh, would choose just to drive through. And then we essentially used the same, used, we backed off a little bit on the COG numbers, but we assumed 25% of potential vehicles would stay less than an hour and would pay a dollar. Uh, and then essentially the fee schedule goes up a dollar an hour up to a $5 maximum for the day. So 25% of vehicles would stay less than an hour, 20% would stay between one and two hours, 9% between two and three hours, 8% um, or 13% over three hours. And um, using the dollar an hour schedule, we end up generating $252,924 from hourly paying pay and display um, parkers. In addition to the 253,000 roughly from that, 
and the uh, 20,000 that, or the uh, roughly 20,000 we get, I'm sorry, it's not 20,000, it'd be 3,500 plus, 20, it'd be about 4,000 in the season passes. Uh, we're proposing that, um, that the buses, the, the non-cruise ship related tour buses pay $50 that the cruise ship related tour buses pay $40, that camp and recreation program buses pay $30, and that the trolley that circulates through the, you know, from Portland through uh, the fort would pay $1,000 um, per trolley per year, which would be another $3,000. And as Maureen mentioned, um, cruise ship or tour bus revenue will not be available this year because there's an 18 month uh, notification requirement for, so that the buses can um, uh, include whatever charges we are, we are assessing into their fee schedules. So no bus revenue um, from tour buses would be available in 2010. Um, and I th there was notification, I think by the end of the year that we were gonna be doing this and therefore that revenue would be available hopefully in 2011. Now, one of the things that um, it's important to understand about the buses is that the passengers on those buses contribute significantly to the sales in the gift shop and also um, people who pass through the museum. And if you look at how many, the number of, what the gift shop sales is during the months when no tour buses are, are coming through or very few are, which is, typically everything except September and October. Um, the tour buses generate over $200 per bus in sales in the gift shop. And that represents over $100,000 a year, which is between 20 and 25% of the total gift shop sales annually. So, you know, we, we were confronted with this and I know, I live off Shore Road, we see the tour buses going down. They only stay a half an hour. They don't really provide wear and tear on the park. They, the passengers get off, they uh, you know, probably go out, they circle around, they look at the water, they walk the path maybe, they go into the gift shop and then they turn around and leave. So the thing we don't wanna do is charge the buses so much that they, they choose not to come because they have other places to go than Portland Headlight when they're visiting um, the greater Portland area. So we felt, we felt um, a $40 fee for the cruise ship related buses and a $50 fee for the non-cruise ship related or foliage tours primarily would hopefully be reasonable enough so that they would continue to come here but would provide some supplemental revenue over and above what we're receiving now. So if we add all of this up, um, in the first year, we generate $285,400 because there would be no tour bus revenue. And in the second year, we would uh, generate $309,674 based on these. We're getting down very, very finite detail here. So, uh, so that more than met the challenge provided to us by the council, which was to generate around $200,000 a year uh, to make the fort self-supporting and thereby return those dollars to the, uh, you know, to the town for use in, in other ways. So hopefully this has provided enough of a, you know, enough of a background. I think there are certain considerations. Um, one is the limited sample we had to go on. Another is that there will be some erosion. You know, if people have to pay, some people will choose to not stay. It's hard to know how many people uh, are gonna be inclined to just drive through or not visit at all if they have to pay um, in order to park. And we also look at this year as a learning opportunity. This, we haven't had good data to work with, which has been one of our biggest challenges. And we look at this year as an opportunity to generate some more substantive information upon which to uh, put together projections for future years. So that pretty well summarizes. Anybody on the commission has other thoughts? If I've left anything off, um, 
The only other comment, we did have uh, some contact with uh, the, pers the people who were doing the tour buses from the ships. He did come in and speak with us, and one of his concerns is that he, they definitely would like to work with us on, um, you know, whatever we're going to institute. However, he did say that in Kennebunk, when they just went ahead and kind of bulldozed forward, a lot of the tour buses decided to stop going to the Kennebunk area. So I do think, um, as Bill pointed out, the revenues that we're getting in the, in the gift shop, we really need to consider that when we're making these decisions. Excuse me, Maureen, could I just ask you or Bill to explain to those in the audience who might not understand the difference between the revenues that go to, to the gift shop, the Portland Headlight Fund, which is separate from Fort Williams Park? Could you just make that clear? Sure. Um, the Portland Headlight is, it's, um, and I don't know if it's called a, a foundation or um, I don't know the correct terminology, but the, the monies that are received from the Portland Headlight sales at the gift shop are are used solely um, or are under their direction. It's not money that is automatically given to the board or to the town council. So when I mentioned earlier that like the, the main gate was uh, part of the monies that the, that the Portland Headlight had gotten as revenue, it was a gift to the Fort Williams uh, Advisory Commission uh, to work on putting up the main gate. So all those monies are under their direction. It's not just given to the fort. And as I understand it, it's limited to enhancing the experience of visitors to Portland Headlight. Correct. So, for example, that money would likely not be available to restore the Goddard Mansion um, or certain other. So it has to, I mean, the, the, the main gate and the fence around it enhances the experience as people drive in. Um, gardens around the, the, uh, lighthouse the lighthouse might be uh, able to, you know, be the beneficiary of that money. The interpretive displays that we put in up on who's, who's? Kitty's Point. Kitty's Point um, was uh, funded from Lighthouse funds. But though that's something that the fort or the advisory commission is able to tap into from time to time with the blessing of the town council, which actually is the custodian of, of those revenues. So the revenues are more like a gift to the fort when they disperse those funds to us. Yes, it's a, a legally separate fund, and there are legal restrictions on the use of that money that's generated at the gift shop um, per the, uh, the agreement that the town made when it purchased the uh, area from the feds. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, that, and thank you for all your work in the rest of the uh, foundation, I mean, the rest of the uh, commission's um, Advisory Commission's work on this. So now is the time for our uh, the public input and questions session of this. And we have a um, not a camera. We have a microphone over here that I'm going to get. And oh, Jason, our technical guy, is getting it. We're going to just start it at one end and work our way around. So. And feel free to pass. You don't have to say anything. Thank you. Please, to refresh your memories, please stand up and state your name and address. Um, try to be brief. Betty Crane, 9 Starboard Drive obviously Cape Elizabeth. Actually, I had a question before I had anything to say, which I do have some things to say, but are we going to hear what the installation costs is going to be on this project tonight? We do have, I mean, you might, you might, you know what, it'll probably be easier if you just take Is there, I thought there was you, you can, here. Yeah, there's one up there. Okay. Um, the cost of the 10 meters, um, and this would be piggybacking with uh, Portsmouth, New Hampshire, that's shipping, installation, training, and associated expenses would be $85,000.
That would also include, we would also have to pay for a concrete uh, installation, signage, um, parking enforcement devices like a boot for people who um, aren't using it, um, traffic analyzer data, uh, utility vehicle for parking enforcement, reconfiguring of the old main gate, which will be um, an essential part of uh, making sure that we don't have parking outside of that area anymore. And so basically, um, for the startup cost, it'll be about $112,113,000. Thank you. Do you want to just oh, okay. hand the microphone? Okay. You might want. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to know about ongoing costs. There's going to be some maintenance and some people that are going to have to work on this project. Um, um, Somebody has to check the sticker. That right, that, that we have park rangers who um, are presently working in the fort, you know, and we have more during the summer than we do um, off season. It'll be their responsibility to check the uh, parking validation in the in the window. And there will be um, some consumables, uh, you know, like the wireless to make them operate about thirty five hundred dollars. That will include any new people that have to come to work. Will you, will you have to hire anybody, or is I don't believe it was an intention that we would have to hire additional rangers beyond what we already have. Either rangers that, is that, that do it. I, I'm just. <laughs> I'm Thank checking you. with Bob. Thank you. Betty, well, Betty, I would just add um, yes. that the report, the whole report's available online. I don't know if we have extra copies in here. No, I'm sorry, we. Don't have extra paper copies, but the whole thing's available online, and it has a lot of the information about costs. And, and I have a little, uh, Mike, from time to answer. If you include the depreciation of the machine, Mike, do you want to take a microphone? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I just want to make sure this is clear. Yeah. If you include the depreciation, just one more thing, Tracy. Yeah. Now look at this. Make it look good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Mike McGovern, the town manager. If you include the depreciation of the equipment, it's estimated that it, it would depreciate by one tenth each year. If you look at, we would have supplemental personnel other than just the rangers to make sure people know how to work the machines, to make sure the revenue comes out. Uh, if you add all that together, there's credit card fees. Most people, it's assumed, would use credit cards. It's a total of $45,000 a year uh, with all those expenses, including the depreciation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. That says a lot. Um, can I go on now for a moment? For yeah, a moment, but for a moment, and then just if after after your moment. No no, 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 no. Go on. Go on. Thank you. Stand up. Um, I first want to thank the council for having this hearing. This is a wonderful idea, and also thank the Fort Williams Commission. You worked very hard, I know, on this project. Um, I'm worried that we do have people here. I don't know how, why they're here until they speak. But I'm a little worried that uh, there's not been enough publicity. This came out only a couple of weeks ago to the general public. It was right in the middle of the holiday season, and people were very busy. And I originally had a feeling that we should actually have a referendum on this eventually. But that is up to you counselors. I mean, you, you are going to have another couple of meetings. But to rush into a vote in February, I think, is much too fast for something that is as important as this to the people of, of Cape Elizabeth. I know the park needs help. And it needs help in the way of funds. That's the only way we can keep the park looking as beautiful as it is. And I still think it's a beautiful park. I hate to hear people say that it's run down. Uh, Bob Malley and Forrest King and the Rangers do an absolutely magnificent job. Every time I go in that park, I'm overwhelmed how beautiful it is. But it's up to you. The council has to do this. And if you feel, as I feel, that the general public as yet does not know enough about 
this pay display system. And they should have the opportunity to study it, to really think about it, possibly think of other ways that we might fund the poor. There's a lot of talent in this town, and there's a lot of people behind the park. We know that from the last referendum vote we had, that really want to keep the park open and free. But we do have to fund it. So it's up to you, counselors. We'll put our faith in you if you think a referendum would be helpful, or at least take some time. Don't rush into this thing, please. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Betty. And if you were worried about publicity, I think you're going to get some <laughs> on tonight's news. <laughs> uh, hello, my name is uh, Jack Sears, and I live on uh, Waterhouse Court in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, first of all, I want to thank the, uh, the council for this new format, giving us a chance to ask questions as well as make comments. And I appreciate the time everybody's put in on the advisory committee and on the council. I know what it's like to work these uh, evenings and long hours and be talking to people. I've been involved with the fort for a number of years on the Charitable Foundation and when we first put together the idea of the Charitable Foundation. That said, I did not give any money to the Charitable Foundation this year because I'm convinced that this council is going to keep coming back here. I want to say something nice because I, you're not going to like the rest of it. I didn't give any money because 28 months, two, less than two and a half years after this town voted 62 to 38 percent against charging fees, the council came back and directed this advisory committee to find a way to make the fort self-supporting. That determined the result you're going to get from this committee. It's got to come back with fees. That's what it was told to do. And so I think it's somewhat disingenuous for the commission to now say, well, look, the town is cutting our school budget. Da, da, da. That happened recently. It was March of last year this committee decided to ignore the town's vote, to slap, I, it's like a slap in the face to people I talk to at the fort, and I go there every day. That's why I got involved. I walk my dogs there usually twice a day. And the people I've talked to out there feel that their vote was disrespected, disregarded, and that's people who voted both ways. Why were they given a chance to vote and then Less than two and a half years later, it was turned over. Uh, and the council comes back and directs the advisory committee, and again, I thank them for the work, to come up with a way to raise fees. I'm opposed to fees philosophically. This town got the fort for $200,000 a song. It's appraised at many, many millions now. It was a public trust. If you don't believe it, go back and look at the town website. See the link to the master plan. It warns you, warns you not to try and download it because it'll take you several minutes, even with a cable or DSL connection. When it got this land, it got it as a public trust. It got it with a lot of uh, conditions, strings attached, limitations that most people don't understand. You go back and read the article, December 30th paper in the Press Herald particularly the comments. It's interesting what people write when they're anonymous behind that username and the hatred and the prejudice and the mean-spiritedness that comes out as people, I see the heads nodding on some counselors, because they think that, you know, we're trying to take advantage of people from away and we're, 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 we're trying to keep them out of our park. Um, I think that we've got a public trust. We accepted this for it at a song and it's our job to take care of it. I think we ought to fund it and, and, and just accept the responsibility. I think people who, who keep talking about put in a restaurant, put in a snack bar, we've looked at that. It can't be done. That's one of the limitations. And people who say, well, let's get the people from away. Let's act like it's a hotel tax and we'll get those people from away. That's one thing. Uh, you know, when you're talking about people from cruise ships, and, you know, I don't, I don't like that idea much either. But when the people from away are from South Portland and, Cape, and, and, and Scarborough and Portland, and you see their comments in the paper, and they're saying, well, why don't we charge the people from Cape to come across the Casco Bay Bridge into Portland? Why don't we charge people in Cape to take their dogs or to take their children down to Bug Light? Why don't we charge the people from Cape if they want to go to Willard Beach or Hinkley Park or to the Promenade or the Deering Oaks? And we're going to start, I think, something of a price war and user fees if we go at it this way. There's something of a social contract, something we have a responsibility to take care of. I don't have any kids in the school system anymore. 
I don't think we should cut the school system to the bone. I haven't voted against any money for the school. I'm not getting anything out of it anymore, but it's a responsibility I feel I have. It was there for my kids, and I think it should be there for your kids and everybody's kids. It makes a better town. And I think this is something I'm proud of. I won't be nearly as proud of it. We're charging people to come in. I won't feel nearly as good about it. And I don't think most people will feel nearly as good about it or as good about the town. And I think we just have to face the fact that, you know, we do what we can with the Ford. If we let it go back a little bit wild, some people like it better that way. Maybe that's what we should do. But I do appreciate your work, but, I, but, I, but I'm opposed to this idea philosophically. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't mean to cut you off, but there's a lot of other people. Excuse me, and if I could just ask, it, it can be intimidating to some folks who might not think as some other folks believe if we have a lot of cheering or clapping or public expressions. I, you know, I, I, I know people want to express their feelings, but we don't want to have a, have a chilling effect and sort of scare off some people who might have different opinions. So I would ask that everybody please res be respectful of everybody else. Thank you. David. I don't know if part of this process is that we can react or give feedback to some sure. of the commentators, but sure. this we are beginning this process on the council, so it's really very helpful, uh, Mr. Sears and, uh, and Ms. Mrs. Crane, to hear from folks at the outset. I don't think any of us on the council have made a determination that February, excuse me, February is going to be our vote no matter what, uh, because we haven't had an opportunity to hear from folks, and it may be that we decide, yeah, gee, maybe we do need another referendum, or it may be that we decide, yes, we're ready to vote in February, but I don't come into this with a preconceived notion of the process. So I, I just want you to understand that, Mr. Sears, that we're not just going to vote February no matter what. Great. Thank you. Frank. So, uh, just to add to that, I'd like to point out the format is, is structured in such a way that we're not having a vote on the same night we're having a hearing, which doesn't really give you credit for what you're saying. I mean, the process here is for us to learn and hear from um, citizens so that we can make reasoned judgments evaluating everybody's points of view. Can I have one more thing? Um, Sarah, I, I think it, you know, it's really hard to sit here because you get yelled at by someone different every choice you make. And so, and then when I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, yeah, he's absolutely right. We can't charge fees. But then the next person can walk in and yell at us about raising property taxes at all. I'm thinking, yeah, he's right. We can't raise property taxes. Then the next person's going to yell at us and say, you can't cut you know, 10 teachers. So I think it would be really helpful if people could suggest, if you're really opposed to Ford fees, do you, you know, do you have any brainstorm ideas about where we might find some money elsewhere? You know, if you're in, in favor of raising taxes instead of charging fees, then let us know that. I mean, because you never hear anybody say, you know, it's okay if you raise our taxes a little as long as you don't do X. So just to get a feel of what in your mind might be an okay alternative, because it kind of ties your hands when no one will let you find money anywhere, but they also don't want you to cut anything. Okay. Okay. Like I said, this is an experiment, so we're sort of... <laughs> We're sort of, I mean, kind of going back and forth here. So anybody who wants to catch my attention on the council, I'm sort of looking out this way. So just yell my name out or yeah, just pitch something at me. I'm used to it. Um, OK, I don't even know where the microphone is. Right? Yes, ma'am. I'm Lois Carlson, uh, 9 Rocky Point Lane. And um, I would appreciate it after I'm finished if all of you would introduce yourselves. I uh, oh. don't know that you are I apologize. known by face <laughs> to all of us, certainly not to me. Uh, I am a vice president of the board of the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation. And I uh, also want to thank you for holding this forum. And I am not here to complain about fees. Um, we have always had, as part of our um, mission that the court remain free and open to everyone. So that has not changed. Um, we are a nonprofit 501c3 uh, corporation, which was founded in, in uh, 2005. And um, our purpose was to provide financial resources to preserve and enhance the unique qualities of Fort Williams Park. To date, we have uh, raised private funds through an annual appeal 
to residents of Cape Elizabeth and surrounding communities. Uh, we have also um, used these funds to support um, projects identified by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. And in fact, we try to work closely with them and they attend our meetings and we attend theirs. Um, and we also support the proposed Arboretum as well as uh, building a small endowment. And I would like to speak particularly this evening, uh, and this is on behalf of the foundation, uh, following a um, fundraising consulting firm that we engaged in October of uh, 2009 to conduct a campaign feasibility and marketing study for a possible capital campaign for Fort Williams. Uh, there, this was a broad-based uh, survey, but I'm only going to speak to a, a specific part of it. Um, this, uh, found, this was uh, performed by Brakeley Briscoe, Inc., which is a national uh, fundraising consulting firm, and um, they spoke with a, a group, select group of our current donors, prospective donors, as to the potential for capital raising capital funds in, in this community particularly. Uh, George Brakeley, a principal of the firm, conducted 17 confidential personal interviews with 20 individuals. Um, everyone uh, interviewed was aware and made this clear to him through the questioning process, uh, that they understood the financial pressures uh, on to which the uh, uh, town council, uh, with which the town council is struggling, and that the council has requested that it be relieved of the obligation to fund the park's operating budget. Uppermost in the minds of most of was the control and use of any funds that may be raised. Everyone raised the issue of fees and were w aware of the current uh, school system deficit. So th this is a knowledgeable group. I think you will find everybody in Cape Elizabeth is a part of a knowledgeable group now. Um, the responses, um, or responders I should say, uh, or the interviewees, were adamant that any revenues generated by fees, and this is parking or entrance, must benefit the park, not the town. This opinion is shared by the foundation board members, and we urge the town council at, to, to spend any funds so derived solely for the benefit of Fort Williams Park. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if, you, if the next person should, could just hold on for a second, um, I'm going to let the counselors introduce themselves, and I apologize for not doing that in the first place. So um, I don't know how we can do this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jim Walsh. Jessica Sullivan, Sarah Lennon, Ann Swift Payola, Penny Jordan, Frank Governale. Uh, David Sherman. And, and our Fort Williams? Maureen McCarthy. Maureen McCarthy and Bill Nickerson. And our town manager is Mike McGovern, and he was over there and he spoke also. So I apologize for not introducing ourselves earlier. Okay, who's next with the microphone? Okay, yes. <laughs> I am Dan Fishbein, uh, Hunts Point Road. Um, First of all, thanks for doing this in this forum. I think this is a great experiment. Hope you'll keep doing that. Um, I think a lot of us have come to realize, as I think you did, that if you have the public hearing and vote immediately after the public hearing, it's possible that decisions have already been made and that the input of the public hearing just doesn't have time uh, to be considered. Also want to make sure I thank you and the uh, Fort Williams Advisory Commission for your volunteer service uh, to Cape Elizabeth. I think it's important for everybody to remember that everybody here is volunteering their time. You know, I think we'd all love everything to be free, have no taxes, have more services, no businesses in town, preserve all our open space, and have no new houses. I think every one of us probably would like every one of those things, but we can't. It's not realistic. So what realistically are the assets that we have? We don't have a lot of businesses in town. 
We don't have a lot of new houses being developed. We're not getting the uh, funding from the state that we used to get, and people don't want to pay more property taxes. So the fort is one of the best assets that we have. And there are ways to generate revenues from the fort without necessarily restricting access. What's being proposed here does not necessarily restrict access. Reasonable fees are OK, and we're all used to that. Every state charges for admission. Acadia charges for admission. Scarborough Beach charges for admission. And uh, many of those places, you are, it's not so easy to get an annual pass or have a, you know, a resident discount. So w what's being proposed in terms of fees uh, seems reasonable, appropriate, and consistent with other things that we're all used to. But I'd also like to challenge uh, the commission, the council, and others to think bigger. Are there other ways that we could raise revenue from the fort in ways that are purely voluntary, things that would not require anybody to uh, spend money? Um, Mr. Sears mentioned that it's been looked at before that we can't have more food service. I, I'd like to know more about that. I'm not sure why that's, why that's true. You know, with an estimated one million visitors to the park every year, um, you know, most of the people who come from out of state, which we heard I think was 28% of those people, that's 280,000 people, um, you know, get out of a car, get out of a bus, snap three pictures, to make a quick visit to the gift shop where somehow amazingly they spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in 15 minutes and leave. What if they had a reason to stay a couple of hours? Think about vacations you've been on when you've taken a bus tour or a land tour from a cruise or just gone on your own. Um, if there was a restaurant there, or seasonal food service with outdoor seating, if there were more uh, retail shops or you know, concession stands, including things that would support local Cape artists and businesses, provide them with a way to sell their uh, wares to hundreds of thousands of people uh, from out of town. I mean, it's easy to do the math. If just 10% of the people who visited the park spent $50, that's $5 million. And if the town was directly involved, perhaps using a vendor as an administrator in providing those services, typically margins on those kinds of services can be in the 50% range. That's two and a half million dollars. And none of that would restrict anybody's access. And nothing that I've just mentioned is really inconsistent with any current uses in the park. In fact, it would probably enhance those uses. So I'd like to suggest that as you deliberate on this, that you consider um, not only the proposals here, uh, but potentially bigger ideas, either in addition to what's been proposed or perhaps even as an alternative to what's been proposed. And that perhaps there be a follow-up work either by the commission or a subcommittee or additional commission to develop a business plan for the park that would set a specific uh, revenue goal and that would think big, something like two and a half million dollars a year. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'm just going to encourage people. I, I want everybody to say their piece, but I just sort of counted the number of people in the room. We've got at least 40 more people who have a chance to speak. And if everybody takes five minutes, it's going to be a, a long evening for everybody. So just try to be succinct if, if you can. So thank you. That wasn't directed at you, Dan. <laughs> I mean, the rule applies to you, too. But it wasn't particularly directed at you. Dan Chase. 26 Stony Brook Road, and I'm a member of the Advisory Commission. I just wanted to respond to a comment that was made previously uh, to the effect that we're proposing to more or less gouge non-residents to support the board. And I just wanted to point out that we, in developing the proposal, we, I think, went out of our way to make the proposed fees apply to everybody, residents and non-residents, at the same rate, uh, except for the annual pass, which, which the residents would get a small break on, um, the, the fees would be shared equally among everyone that uses the fort. So we, we are not trying to gouge outsiders in my view at least. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. I'm Colleen Graves, Meadowview Lane. Uh, volunteerism is pretty well demonstrated in this room and throughout Cape Elizabeth. And my comment to you is that we have demonstrated repeatedly in this community that when the alarm bell gets sounded, people respond. And we've put a lot of money into privately funded projects, turf field, bleachers, road races, et cetera, et cetera. 
You want to know where the money comes from? It comes from general funds of people's private pockets. Whether or not you like the idea that you're trying to be fair, a fee at a public park smacks of exploiting. Exploiting locals, exploiting tourists. I'm going to feel like I'm in Mexico being exploited as a tourist every time I go to the park. That's just a feeling, but that's how people are going to respond. And Cape Elizabeth, for better or worse, is seen as being more affluent and better able to absorb costs. So there is a PR issue as well as a fairness issue. And in hard economic times, public places are the only places some people can go for a respite. So a few dollars here and a few dollars there may not seem like a lot. But when you put it in the aggregate, what people are up against, it really is a direct impact on their quality of life. Thank you. Thank you. My name is George Morse, uh, 1148 Shore Road. And uh, philosophically, I agreed with much of, of what Mr. Sears mentioned, but I come to a different conclusion. Uh, and I favor the proposals that the advisory committee has uh, put forward because the numbers make a difference to me. There is no um, day fee or entrance fee. So those that live close and are likely to use it most often for recreation still can walk there and go at no charge. Uh, and so whether they're from Cape Elizabeth or South Portland or, or other places. Um, so it mostly apply to the local people that live close enough to walk to the park. Uh, second, the charges for the commercial uh, buses are, are not going to probably make any dent in the, the number that go because of the low, low level. And for educational buses, there is no, no charge. The um, question of gouging outsiders, I looked at the fees for uh, the parks in, in Scarborough and their seasonal passes are several uh, times um, what uh, is being proposed here. And so at $10 and $20, I don't think that's going to make much of a difference. For the, average, for the house of 300000 they're now paying about $26 of their property tax going toward the park compared to $10 of a season pass. That's a good deal. And for those outside, the $20 is low compared to some of those neighboring um, questions. Fourth, the park needs some additional investments, and it has to come, come from someplace. I do agree, however, that as the commission recommends, the, uh, the money sh that is raised should remain with the park, be reinvested in the park. It shouldn't, we shouldn't look at the park is some kind of cash cow that can fund a variety of other services, at least in the short run, because we don't know if we, if you raise rates above what's proposed, how much that'll uh, diminish the use of the park. So thank you to the commission and to the council. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Frank Stroud. I live at 1184 Shore Road. I want to thank the council and this full format. I think this is a tremendous idea to, to bring it to the public and uh, have a discussion uh, about fees and, and other issues that are in town that, uh, under these very trying times. Um, the last time this was brought up, I was strongly opposed to fees. Uh, I thought it was the wrong idea. I think the fort is a wonderful place. I'm there on a, almost a daily basis walking my dogs. I enjoy it. I think it's a real asset to the town. But times are different now. Uh, times are a little more challenging, and uh, the budget constraints are now making us look at all the different services we have in town and, and how we're going to actually come, come away with a balanced budget. Uh, I haven't made up my mind on fees. Unfortunately, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm still neutral on this. I go back and forth on it. Uh, I'm concerned about the taxpayers having, or the, the, the residents of Cape Elizabeth having to pay a fee but I can understand the fairness of the issue when you look at people from outside the community uh, coming in to, to, to use Fort Williams. Um, 
one thing I, I do feel strongly about is that it should be a designated revenue. Uh, if you're going to raise fees at the fort, the fees should stay within the fort to, to maintain and, and, to, and to keep that, uh, keep that as, a, as a, just a beautiful park and a wonderful place to be. I remember uh, many years ago when the town made the decision to actually purchase the fort, and at that time it was a debate whether we could raise the money to, to actually purchase it and to keep it as the wonderful open space it is. And open space at Cape Elizabeth is, is one of the things that we really strive for and we look to, to and it makes this place just a wonderful place to be. So, but uh, back on fees, I'm not sure I've, uh, I've fully weighed in on the issue enough to, uh, to feel comfortable weighing on one side or the other. I'm glad that we're having this debate. I look forward to seeing it more in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, Brad Smith, 10 Surf Road. I'm disappointed we're here tonight. <clears throat> and while I appreciate you folks opening the process up again, it was not that long ago that we went through this exact same process of asking and examining user fees. And nothing's changed, except that the economy's a little tighter. But it's going to get better, and it's going to get worse, and it's going to go through cycles. But nothing's different now than it was 28 months ago, and here we are again. The voters spoke clearly. And the reasons were articulated in this meeting and on the streets of, of our town. What has changed is, is the sense that by charging user fees, we're going to solve the town's budget. Let's be realistic. This represents less than one half a percent, less than one half of one percent of the town's budget. We have a $30 million budget in this town. A $175,000 operating fee is less than one half of 1%. This won't solve the town's problems with budget, and it doesn't create the town's budget problems. Several years ago, my wife and I went to Boston to look at the Freedom Trail, and it was free. And the Minuteman Museum was free. And we were so inspired. And as volunteers at Portland Head Lighthouse, we know what it's like to be able to share that park and that lighthouse with the visitors that come across this country and from overseas. But when we went to see the site of the Boston Tea Party, it was gone. Somewhere between 1773 and the beginning of the 1900s, that area, that wharf, that waterway was filled in for better use, for more commercial use, and what stands now are office buildings and a marker. And we can never go back. We're not going to destroy those buildings to recoup the site of the Boston Tea Party. You can't go back on some things. This lighthouse has stood since George Washington commissioned it. Never in this history has there been a fee in order to access that park and to see that lighthouse. And once it's there, we can never do it away with it again. It will be there forever. So let's be honest. This solution doesn't solve the budget problems, and it changes the very flavor of that park. It's not about raising money. It's not about driving through and taking a quick look. Over 50% of the people are there for an hour or more according to the data. It's a place that people go to find comfort. It's a place that people go to rejoice, to get married, to contemplate, to pray, to celebrate, to, to slide in the winter, to skate on the, on the rink, to walk, to exercise. It's a place where the community can come that's free. And we're lucky to have it. And I agree with the gentleman who said, it's not just a responsibility, though. It's an opportunity for us to share this treasure without charge to the rest of the world. And I hope we don't ever change that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, Carol Dane, Three Hill Way. Um, when we had the last referendum, the people of the town were very clear in what they wanted. I think we have to go back to the town people and ask them all again. 
I don't think a very small sample of people can, can be representative of what the feeling of the town was when the town was really clear not that long ago how they felt. Come back to us and ask us again. Hi, my name is uh, Greg Gordon from Nine Meadow Way. I grew up in Cape Elizabeth and returned back here with my family uh, about two and a half years ago. And I love this place. I also do work with the cruise ships and, and responsible for uh, all the cruise ship passengers and the buses that actually come into Cape Elizabeth at Fort Williams to the tune of about 340 buses this upcoming season. And next year, hopefully, that'll be um, even more. One thing I think we need to remember is that Portland marquee really is Fort Williams and Portland Headlight. And we need to make sure that people want to come back and visit us. And if we start to charge a fee to come to visit Fort Williams, people are going to choose to go somewhere else instead. And it won't be no longer considered the most photographed lighthouse in the world. One thing when you're considering this is that to really implement a fee structure, whether it be a, um, um, the pay, and pay as you go, um, you're going to need to be able to monitor that and have people out there. They're going to have to pay a fee. You're going to have to pay someone to realistically be out there and do this as a full-time job, as, as a seasonal position. Um, you're not going to be able to take the current people you have and really work them in another capacity to offset this cost. And Oh, they can just handle this. And that's going to be, I think, a very challenging part, and it's going to add, add additional uh, cost to the people that are coming to visit. Now, when you're talking about people, um, and let's be very honest, is that you know, cost can be associated with coming into Fort Williams. They're going to choose to just to drive through. Now, if you have a bus that chooses to drive through Fort Williams because they've not stopped, there's not going to be revenue coming into the Lighthouse Museum, and it's not going to be revenue coming back, which they spoke about earlier. We need to be very, very clear about what the value of this position is going to be. The example is used of, of uh, Kennebunkport of a couple of years ago where they implemented a $50 per bus fee. And to the tune of cruise ship passengers and regular tour buses not coming back to, Fort, to uh, Kennebunkport. It took about four or five years to get them back. I see part of people coming to Portland as also being able to come out to Fort Williams and visit our wonderful park. And let's be very careful about trying to implement a fee structure. You know, you're talking about a $40 fee. You know, that's a huge amount of money for our costs. And now you're charging instead of $1 per hour per, bu um, per, per uh, car, you're now charging $40 or $50 or a dollar per person for every cruise ship passenger. So it does change a little bit on your fee structure that you have out there. And if you use your example of one of the buses that are coming in here on a, on a consistent seasonal basis, after they come 25 times to an extent, they've already paid their $40 per bus fee. So they are going to be here from May through the end of October, and maybe that price needs to be changed too if you decide to go in that manner. But if you do decide to go with, it, with a fee structure, you know, I think the, that the cost that you're going to be having of $40 and $50 per bus is high. And you might want to look at reducing that cost there. It's more reasonable. And the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to, people that are going to drive through Fort Williams, say hello and goodbye, and never stop by. The one thing that you will need to start thinking about if you do choose to start to implement these fee structures is people are going to start asking questions about bathroom facilities. Everyone pretty much is, is accepting the facility of these porta parties. But once you start charging a fee, I'm going to come back and say, you know, where's our dollars? Where's the revenue going to be going back to? And they're going to ask, you know, for a fee structure to help offset some of these experiences that people want. So thanks for your time. Thank you. And I have a, I have a question, sir. And I didn't catch your last name. It's Greg Gordon. Gordon. Um, I have a question for you, just because you work about work with, do you work for cruise? You said you work with cruise ships? Sure. I work with a company called um, Intercruises. So I've been working in the Portland market since about 2001. OK. And we work in Portland. We also work in multiple ports. But I primarily focus my area on New England. OK. And my question, because this sure. is a chance for counselors to learn, too. My question is, do um, the folk, I've never been on a cruise. Sure. So um, folks who go on a cruise, when they have these trips, when they come into port, bus trips or whatever, yep. um, do they ever go to places that charge uh, admission of any sort? Yeah, they do. No question about it. They definitely do. Um, and how does, how does that work? Do they just build the admission into the, what, the, what the cruise ship charges for that bus Correct. tour? Yeah, they definitely do charge that, 
they do incorporate that fee structure into the into the price points. As you know, in this day and age, you know people um, want to keep everything as low as cost as possible. Sure. So if you choose to add in a fee structure, we're going to go back to the cruise lines and say, you know, the cost is now going to be approximately one dollar per person more to go to visit Fort Williams. They might choose to go to Freeport, or we might choose to spend more time sure. in Kennebunkport and bypass Fort Williams. But I think that what you're really that's going to have happen is they're going to drive through Fort Williams and okay. not stop. I, I understand your point. I'm just trying to learn here. Um, so what other places for cruise ships coming into Portland and the little tours that they take on buses, um, what other places Char around do that, that charge? Charge a fee? Yes. None. None? So there are none in Portland that charge well, you, you have fee. museums that, that charge a fee. If they go to Victoria Mansion, okay. they go on the duck tour. Okay. Um, you know, there are fees that are associated with visiting a venue, but not to visit um, a park like Fort Williams. Okay. Now, Great. one thing you're probably going to say is, is that Acadia National Park does charge a fee to visit the park, and that's their, the park loop road. Um, and that's a national regulation that's at, set out there for any commercial vehicle, they charge $150 per, per bus fee. But that goes to Zion or Bryce or Acadia National Park or any of their major um, national parks. OK, great. While, while we've got this expert, <laughs> is any I other here, I'm more than happy questions? to come and talk to you more. Pardon me? I'm more than happy to come back. And well, if you, if you don't, we're happy to have you come back. But while we've got you at the moment and while you're on TV so people at home can hear this, we're going to Take advantage of your knowledge. You so, Great. Jim Walsh. Correct. Your 18, 18 months is actually accurate. It takes, they, they do it about 12 to 14 months out. But you, what you really need to do is, is that, I already know about this, so I'm going to be very clear about that to, to, my, um, to my vendors. So that's all the cruise lines from Princess to Carnival, uh, Royal Caribbean, all those major cruise lines. Your real concern is more of these rogue buses that are going to come in here off of these mom and pop tours from the Midwest. They're going to come into Portland and Kenema, or, or Cape Elizabeth and aren't going to know about the fee structure, and you're going to turn them away. OK. Um, so, this, this sure. It's, it's the tour operator, you know. But they are going to change the cost, essentially, or have surcharge or whatever to the system. Yeah, I thought he just said it was absorbed by the tour company. I would have to absorb it myself. So the tour company it, makes it, less. If you're charging a fee yeah. right now, and, and the price of gas goes up by up to $4 or $5 a gallon, like it was a couple of years ago, um, you know, we already have our contracted rates out there, so we wouldn't be able to change those at that time. If it was an 18-month lead time, yeah, you'd be able to change something at that point. Sarah, I mean, I'm sorry. But I think that your concern is what that, what that cruise ship is actually going to do, because I can give them my rates, and that cruise ship can choose, you know, I'm going to bypass Fort Williams and go somewhere else. Um, Jessica. You know Each cruise line is going to charge a different rate, um, but it is a revenue source for the cruise lines. So if you went on a cruise um, in 2009 or in 1999 or in 1989, your price would probably be lower today than it was in 1989 because those costs are going to be um, set up in a different manner now. So they have a low price point to get you on the ship, and they're making their revenue from other areas. And shore excursions is a way that they do make revenue. Do you so know what, that, what they charge? Any any idea of what they actually charge? You can go to their websites and tell you. I can't give out their information, unfortunately. Each one's different. But it also depends on the program. You know, because you have, you have a bus cost associated with it. You have a tour guide. You have um, all different areas that are all incorporated into it. Liability insurance and everything else. Thank you. Sarah. 
just off the record. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're on the record. We've got cameras everywhere. You know, everyone keeps citing Kennebunk, but I'm thinking Kennebunk is 40 minutes away from Portland, and Portland Headlights is seven minutes away. So I'm just saying, is there kind of like a double graph that they put together on what's desirable, and if they do, I'm kind of guessing that Fort Williams is high up because it's both interesting to people, historical, and it's very near. So if you're just talking gasoline and hassle, to me, it's, it's a higher premium than either Freeport or Kennebunk. Is that right or wrong? Well, unfortunately, Freeport is, is, is competing with the downtown the business community. Jim. And they came up with a passport to solve that problem uh, this year to keep people in Portland. I mean, do you think that if we charge a little bit, people would stop coming or not? Just. He may not be able to say. Yeah. I, I, our intent is not to put you on the spot. We appreciate your, your inf information. I'll talk to you afterwards. How's that? OK. Um, Frank? Just so I promise we'll leave you alone after Just, this. just so I'm clear. The, um, if a passenger signs up to go on a tour, they pay an additional amount to the uh, boat? It, it, it's all paid to the cruise ship directly. They pay to the, and the cruise ship then pays into cruise? Correct. Based upon the number of passengers? Or, uh, based upon the number of people taking the tour? Yeah, it's a head. It's and what do you charge, into, what does intercruise charge the ships per head? Fort Williams. It really depends on the program that they're on. You know, we have nine-hour tours that go to Mount Washington. So we charge them a certain amount of money to go on the bus tour out to Mount Washington. They go on the cog rail up to the top, and they come right. back. And so what, um, so what tour so is Fort Williams attached to? Just we have a few different tours. We have a, tour, a two-hour tour that incorporates Fort Williams with a city tour of Portland that's two hours in length. We have a, a lighthouse as a main tour that focuses on visiting Bug Light, Spring Point, and Portland Headlight, and an inside visit to the museum. Um, we also have a six-hour tour that incorporates Portland and Kennebunkport, so they come and visit Portland Headlight for 30 minutes, and we have a, a land and sea tour that does a visit to Portland Headlight and goes out on one of the schooners, too. Thank you. Okay. Sir, I really thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We've sort of grilled you here, but thank you very much. It's very useful information to all of us. Okay, and I'm going to repeat only because the council's been asking all these questions, but we're chewing up time. So please try to be brief and succinct if, if you can. Next Hi, person. Kathy Johnson, Arrow Point Road, here in Cape. Um, how many towns can boast three magnificent parks, a town our size? Two of them charge money. I can count the times on one hand I've been to, I've lived here 30 years, to Crescent Beach when my kids had beach days when they were in third grade or something. Um, I go to Fort Williams four times a week, at least. I implore you to look at other ways to raise money. Um, as we were saying, I, I think I need some clarification about what we can actually do in this town. Um, we have a gold mine in that gift shop, and I'm something of an expert on gift shops, having owned one for 10 years right here in South Portland. Um, that gift shop's not open all the time. And I think there are other ways that we can merchandise it or do things differently, but I don't know. I think there's some kind of um, stipulations that I'm not aware of. And I keep saying, wouldn't it be better to eat an ice cream cone in, Cape, in Fort Williams than at a parking lot at Reds or across the street from the cemetery at Beals? I mean, we have a gold mine. People want to have a lobster roll. Why can't they eat it at Fort Williams? So I, I guess I need from the council or from the advisory committee, what are the stipulations for what we can do in that park and what can't we do? Thank you, Kathy. I'm going to ask the manager to address this question, please. Mike, you might want to, I don't know if oh, that one. Oh, okay. <laughs> At least that's what they tell me. Uh, what are the stipulations for the park? The park was purchased um, in the year 1964. Uh, the primary, there are two stipulations that I recall in the deed. Uh, one is that we have to provide water service to Portland Headlight. And the second in, relates to, and it, it's also in the Portland Headlight deed, that if there are veterans uh, and uh, government officials and their official acts, we need to allow them to provide access. Beyond that, the deed for Fort Williams Park is free and clear of any commitments or obligations. It's uh, the deed is very clear. Uh, Portland Headlight, uh, 
has very similar restrictions. Uh, we have to provide Coast Guard access to uh, use it as an aid to navigation. Any active duty military needs to be provided free access uh, without charge. Uh, we uh, also, uh, we do have a separate 501c3, uh, but the, when there was, George Mitchell, when he was the majority leader, got an amendment uh, to the Coast Guard budget bill that said that the land would be transferred to the town of Cape Elizabeth, the lighthouse, for one dollar. Uh, there were no other restrictions. Uh, however, there is a separate 501c3, and those bylaws, though, are determined by the board of directors of the 501c3, uh, which consists of the seven members of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. But, you know, I've had instances over the years where the, the Cape Elizabeth Town Council has asked the Fort Williams has asked Portland Headlight Trustees or something, and then the Portland Headlight Trustees have said no, uh, because they realize they have a different hat on then and, and have to make a different situation. We also have some restrictions on the use of the, on the park in terms of some grants that were received over the years, and that basically says that you can't have discriminatory fees within the park except to the degree that you can justify and show uh, why the fees are uh, are, are discriminatory, uh, resident versus non-resident. Mike, is there any restriction on the size of the gift shop? Because I, just to sort of echo what Ms. Johnson had asked, if there are more offerings, yeah, presumably it, you need a larger building. On the Lighthouse property itself, there are, there are two challenges. One is shoreland zoning, and the second is we currently have a licensed overboard discharge. Uh, th there is no septic tank. They would be very expensive connected to the sewer. And that's why there are no public restrooms allowed inside the lighthouse itself. There, there are restrooms there, but it's limited strictly to the, the staff and the volunteers because otherwise it would overtax the, our license for the overboard discharge. It's a licensed overboard discharge. I want to make that clear. <laughs> yes. Okay. Anybody else on the Okay. And just real quick, yes. Uh, since we had a committee that was going to do the parking thing, could we put a committee together that could look at these other opportunities? And then we'd have all the information. And I would volunteer to be on that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ken Johnson, uh, Arrow Point Road. I was always told, my father was told to agree with my wife, so I, I did all, all her stuff. <laughs> I, I think in these tough times, everyone is looking for ways to increase revenue. I think what the town very clearly uh, said 28 months ago is that the fee issue is, is not one of the ways that the town wants to increase revenues. Um, I'm going to bring up a couple issues, um, and I'm sure that Dave, who uh, has kids playing sports, will see that there's going to be some athletic um, issues with the fee structure. Uh, Casco Bay soccer, at least for since the field has been built, and my kids are out of Casco Bay for three years now. But we, that field was used pretty much every Saturday and Sunday. Um, I've, my kids have played soccer for 14 years. I have never paid a parking fee for one of my kids to go play Casco Bay soccer all around the state. That's one thing. The next thing, um, if I didn't want to pay a parking fee, I would. I would park at Playstead Park or the Little League Field. Uh, I'm not sure what you're going to do. Um, you can't charge people to go watch their kid play Little League in their town, but how are you going to stop people from parking there? And with our hectic lives, there's so many people who show up for Little League at you know, one minute before the game. I don't know what they're going to do if they can't park. They can't park on the streets. That place is just big enough uh, to, to handle it. I, I um, you ask about. I think I'll stop and just talk about opportunities. Uh, Ann and Jim, we raised $125,000 to send a group of high school kids to uh, Scotland. Uh, it took us about 14 months, Jim. I think. Uh, what did we do? We had uh, we had a potluck. We had a dinner, which uh, vendors actually paid paid us to serve their product for free for the people who came. We had the um, we had wonderful uh, talent show. We did many many things that we raised $125,000 in 14 weeks. Uh, I go to the um, um, where all the local um, farms in in uh, Daring Oaks every Saturday. 
you can't park within a half a mile of that place. Why can't we have a farm day on, on Sunday in, in Fort Williams? I think there's a lot of things also that the fort is used that I don't think fees work. And I just wrote them down. T-ball games, you know, I'm not sure I, I want my parents to have to pay for parking to watch my kids play T-ball. That's not that exciting. Um, <laughs> uh, art in the park, family fun days. Um, all the high school, the high school soccer uh, kids play soccer all summer there. They play from teams all over. These kids who are coming by themselves, are, are they going to have to pay to go and play? I said the Casco Bay Soccer Fourth of July Symphony. Hopefully that's going to come back. What are we going to do there? Am I going to have to pay uh, to park there for my kids graduate from high school? What's going to happen to that? Um, I also made the mistake of trying to uh, reserve the uh, pavilion. I called on July 5th. How stupid was I? Um, because it was all booked every Saturday and Sunday for the whole summer. That sort of gives you an idea. We have a couple revenue things. We have the gift shop that's successful. We have the pavilion, which you can't get. We probably could have five more in work. Um, it, it seems like the other side of the revenue equation is, is really what we have to, uh, have to address. Um, I would also like to know, and I, it's none of my business, but what does the lobster shack make in revenue? That, you know, could, we, could we put something there that makes half that, a quarter of that, a quarter of that? I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of other opportunities. Thank you, Ken. Tom Graney, uh, Old Fort Road. Um, uh, this is a little bit like Tabor. I, I think I just voted against fees very recently, and it pops back up again. And I think the, the, the one thing that, I, that comes to mind is somebody put out a number of $26 for the average $300,000 house. Right. So we're, we're sitting here trying to save $26 on the tax rate of, of Cape Elizabeth. And that's, that's a good thing to be doing. It's good to save the pennies and everything. But $26, that's, you know, that's not our major problem. If, if, sir, if I could just respond, though, and I appreciate your sentiment. Uh, Right here, but we we debate that amount when we're talking about the school budget, and it, it seems like there are a lot of people willing to pay the extra twenty six dollars per household, but there are a lot of people who aren't. So I don't mean to be flip, but and I know you're not intending to be, but it it, it just sort of all adds up, and uh, it, you know I I personally uh, think there. I, I'm happy to, to pay the extra to support the fort, but there's just a lot of people who are looking at those dollars and cents saying no, no more. So that's, that's one reason why we're here. Okay. Just, just one comment. Are these people who just moved in in the last 28 months? Uh, because we, we did vote sort of overwhelmingly. Right, and, and I, I appreciate that, and I think one of the themes I'm hearing, or one of the issues we're going to have to figure out, is whether this goes back to another referendum. But when I ran for the council just a year ago, I heard from virtually every person I spoke with saying, pay and display fees at Fort Williams, make Fort Williams profitable, make it a, you know, make it a, a revenue source. And I, I, we are just continue to hear it overwhelmingly, and, and it, that's why I'm happy we're doing this tonight, because we're hearing from a lot of people who say the opposite. So I appreciate that. Oh, hang, hang on, ma'am. Okay. The other point I just want to make, and it regards not this statement in particular, but just in general, this conversation. Remember, part of the Commission's comments related to deferred maintenance and other projects that have not been funded. So we're not just talking about the 26 bucks a year. We're talking about other projects which uh, we have not been able to afford in the past. So just keep that in mind. Uh, yes, John Graney, uh, Old Fort Road. And Tom and I walk through the park each day. And it's just horrible to think of meters in that park. Try any other way but not meters. That it just goes against the beauty, the the solemnness, the peacefulness, 
of that park. Do not put meters in. Thank you. Hey, hang on, we've not got a comment here. Can I ask you a question? These other ideas that have come up, the, the, the other opportunities and revenues, three people now have spoken to that, Mr. Fishbein and, and Ms. Johnson and Ken, I didn't get your last name. That idea intrigues me a lot. Would that, would you feel that was as offensive and intrusive or is there something particular about the parking meter that annoys you? I mean, what if there were a lobster shack or an ice cream store or? No, it, it's, it, for me it's particularly the meters. Uh, we moved here from Massachusetts and live near Borderland State Park. It was wonderful. You would go there any time of the week, just on a whim for a walk, and then they did it. They put in parking meters. I'm sorry, but it just took away from the whole essence of the freedom of Borderland State Park. You would drive, hmm, here's the meter, and you put your money in as you're leaving. It, it, it does not, it's not the same. And Fort Williams is just way too beautiful to do that to. Uh, and Maureen just wanted to. The pain, dis the pain display meters are not like parking meters. There, there will be one per parking area. So it's not like there will be a plethora of meters. That's what they have there. Okay. Unless it's there, you can drive by it and, and come out through it. It takes away from the freedom of just visiting. And I feel for for the people. Excuse me, ma'am. Could you just use, I don't know where the mic is. feel for the people from, from out of state, too, because having moved from out of state, everyone comments on, oh, yes, that the picture, you know, in the calendar, it's January's picture this year, and some calendars and so forth. Everyone knows of this park, and everyone feels like they could visit whenever they want. Just not meters, not pay parking. Uh, try anything else. How would you feel about an entrance fee? Well, you know, an entrance fee. If, for instance, in June, July, and August, you had, for instance, two very nice high school students hired, and they would not be at the entrance, but they'd be further up the road, and they would just be there and perhaps hold the box and would say, this, to maintain the fort, and what it would be it would be just like a dollar a car, which would still amount to a lot of money. And if these people weren't there all the hours of the day, it wouldn't matter. Some cars would go through, but you would have you would also be giving monies to uh, people in the young people in the town who would need a job for those three months. That does not seem as offensive for some reason. It would just be like, we need a little help this year, and perhaps it would only be that year. Uh, it would be a trial. Uh, it, it personal, and it would just seem to uh, perhaps be a little easier for cars coming in to take with uh, a sign advising them of what they were going to see. And, and then it would also still be voluntary, they could say no, too, and just drive through if they were doing that. Okay. Okay, thank you. And could I ask Maureen or Bill or Mike or somebody, we have not, like this lady said, teenagers standing at the roadside with a box, but we, we do collect voluntary donations at the fort right now? There are collection boxes. Uh, there's one at the parking lot at Battery Blair, there's one at the lighthouse, and then we installed, I can't remember where the other one is. Oh, the beach parking lot. So and, there are three. And how much do we get out of those? Um, I can't, it's minimal. It's like $30. <laughs> a $14 a day. So, okay. Somebody multiply that for me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and is that every, that's not every day though. We don't need as much. It's less than $100 a week. But those are passive boxes, not like actively recruiting. Okay. No. You would walk by it and see no, it and say. I just wanted to make clear, because some people, some people have asked that um, we should put out volunteer, you know, voluntary donation boxes, and there are, there are already boxes. some there. So I just want to make that clear. Um, I don't know where the microphone is. Great. Thank you. Laurie Jensen, Cragmore. Um, I have a question, and then I have a comment. I'm wondering, are the Rangers going to be able to hand out tickets to people who park 
<coughs> excuse me, but who don't buy a ticket for the parking? The manager is the man with that answer. We, we had a meeting today about that uh, with the chief of police, the director of public works. It, it's not, you know, so, some issues be decided, but it's been said a couple of times that Harry Hardy is going to be giving out tickets. Harry needs to be reassured that he's not the person giving out tickets. <laughs> we, we still have the responsibility. Harry, of, Harry is the Harry's ranger. the one in the back who's, who's uh, one of the rangers at the park. We, we really need other personnel who are involved in helping people if we do this uh, with the paid display and with the enforcement. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't be the rangers, although they might occasionally do it, but it's really going to take other people to do it and the estimates and the cost are worked into that. Uh, the ticketing would be done, you know, we look at, if, if this happens, that, the, that these parking uh, assistants are going to be mainly trying to help people figure out the machines, figure out the way the system works, help people who haven't paid it to show them, that, you know, this is where you need to put the money in that you didn't. Uh, the, the current ordinance does allow ticketing. It does allow for the chief of police to designate another municipal employee other than a police officer to do ticketing. Uh, that's heard in the ordinance. We also coincidentally met with the representatives of the police union today, and that's their understanding as well. Uh, that, that would be the direction that we would be going. So uh, we're, we're trying to look at all those issues just in case uh, this is approved. Okay. I get it, Laurie? <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. But the other thing I wanted to say is I've been volunteering at the museum for about, oh, I don't know, six years or so before I even moved to Cape Elizabeth. And the most frequent questions that we get, besides why can't we go up into the tower, are <laughs> um, where are the bathrooms and where are the trash cans? And for the past few years, I've been able to say, well, we don't have those things. We can't afford to have those. But the trade-off is the park is free. And in order to keep the park free, we basically can't provide trash cans and the maintenance that would require emptying them probably every half hour all over the park. Um, I don't know what I'm going to say when, we, when people start having to pay a fee. Um, I guess th those, are, those are my two main concerns. And they're, they're minor, but they're there. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Rackmeyer, and I work for the Main Tour Connection, which is a wholesale receptor tour operator that brings those motor coaches to <laughs> the park. And uh, not to be on the hot seat again is Greg. <laughs> I'd be we'll go than, easy on you, I promise. I'd be more than happy to talk at a different time and questions that you do have. And I would be cons um, the fee structure that you're doing, uh, pretty much what Greg said, is how we would feel as well. And the difference that you're doing between cruise ships and regular tour operators um, shouldn't be a difference in that because we're bringing just as much volume to there as well. There is the concern that more charges that go on to the package makes it too expensive. So then you are forcing them to pick a different state <laughs> if, the, if the package is cheaper to go to New, excuse me, New Hampshire. That's going to make that determination as well. Um, so not to get into that, but some of the ideas like the gift shops, those motor coaches, shop, <laughs> no matter where they are. It's a good resource, and I think it was 25% is an increase, or what they bring to the, I don't know who said that. Okay. Okay. To me, that's a good resource to maybe look at uh, doing a meet and greet for those coaches, go on, explain it, give away a free token to the driver and tour escort to get them to bring more people into the gift shop to shop, make something fun about it. And it's also a good way to get on, on the coach to say, here's where we are, it's a free, donations are acceptable. Educate them that you need something. Okay. So, thank thank um, uh, we, I think I'm not we have gonna, a question for I'm not going to grill you, but it, it would be really helpful if, I don't know if you have a business card with you, because we may have, would you be willing to give me, give me your card? Because we may have questions. To, uh, <laughs> but uh, just because I think a concern that a lot of us have 
on the council maybe just town-wide is that if we impose these fees, all of a sudden we're going to lose the tour bus traffic and we're going to then lose the gift shop revenue. So it, it just, and you're not going to have a monopoly on this discussion, but it just might be helpful. Right, to, and I didn't want to do that now, but I would certainly pass the business card and that's part of it. It's not just the park fee, it's the state tax that just went up. Massachusetts increased it, New Hampshire's increased it, depending on where they're located. So now we took a package that may have been I don't know, $300 a person, and it's increased 25%. And yes, it might not sound like a lot of money, a dollar per person, excuse me, <clears throat> but it starts adding up to that package where could they go to Branson instead of Maine, <laughs> or could they go someplace else? So that's part of it as well. I think, um, I think there was somebody over here that had a question. Ken, did you have a question for, for this lady? But I don't, I don't want to open the door to everybody asking questions of this poor lady. I wonder if we pay buses to come, what that would do is quite clearly spend $200 a week on buses. And that's not going to be good. And they shop no matter where they are, what, and it doesn't matter if it's Freeport or a small little gift shop or a small little town. It's a shopping is a must. <laughs> it has to be. If you don't give them time to shop, they get antsy. So it is a good resource to kind of look at okay. an option. Okay. Was there another? Yes, Frank. If if there was a uh, restaurant or a food a restaurant or a food concession or something like that, would the tour operators have to adjust their schedule to permit people the time to sit down? And is that something that's even possible? Uh, for us, because we um, put together t the package, we do the whole I itinerary. So we map them from wherever they're coming to, all of New England and Eastern Canada. So if, if for the majority of it, they're on their own for lunch. So yes, if we, I can you know give you numbers of how many tours we put into the old port for lunch on their own. Would it be just as easy to put them? at the lighthouse for lunch on their own? Sure. Simple. <laughs> Sarah, can I follow up on that? I, I've been <laughs> along this line. I don't know, Dan Fishbein, if you've thought any more about this, but your 2.5 million caught my attention. So have you envisioned a way that your scenario could be put in the park without it being excessively intrusive or tacky? And then it would sort of segue into paying buses to come rather than getting them to pay us a small amount. In other words, it's sort of big fish versus small. How, that's my first question. How do you do it without changing the nature of the park? And the second question is, have you considered how much revenue would have to be dumped in in order to start pulling it out? Or maybe you haven't gone that far. The simple answer is no, I haven't gone that far. But. Um, I think a lot of times we forget just how big the park is. It's enormous. And there's plenty of room to put in some food service and, some, and a bigger gift shop without it really you know, being, being much of an impact. Excuse me, Mr. Fishbein. I would ask the folks up back who are making comments about Mr. Fishbein's comments to please refrain. And I would remind you, ma'am, of what you said when we started. You spoke once, everybody got their off. What they're discussing now should have been done in the Sir, you're out of Sir, you're out of order. So are you. Sir, you're out of order. I'm chairing this meeting and you are out of order and you will be removed if you can't behave. Now, Mr. Fishbein was asked a question by a counselor, and that's entirely within the process that's outlined. I intend to have a calm and respectful meeting, and I think everybody's been doing a really good job till now. So I would ask that that continue, please. So Mr. Fishbein, if you need to finish your, yeah, your answer. And it'll be very quick. Um, you know, one other, one other thought, and it might be interesting to have um, the tour operators comment on this, is if there are bus fees, but if a bus agreed to stay for 90 minutes and, would, and we waive the fee, would that be a, of interest? Because, you know, from tours I've been on, and my expertise is being on tours, it seems that that's, there's a lot of things like that that go on. The tour operators say, here's lunch, and by the way, we need you to stay at this place and this gift shop for the next 90 minutes. There must be something behind that. Okay, I, I think 
I think we need to move on because there are some more people up in the, uh, the last couple of rows that want to make comments. And then if people want to come back to this, we can do that. But time is a fleeting. So thank you, ma'am. You're next. Could you speak into the microphone, please, ma'am? Uh, my name is Betty Shea. I live on Maplewood Road. Thank you. I don't think that uh, Fort Williams needs to be a botanical garden. I think it's better, a little natural, just to have a place to walk, have healthy, free exercise for young and old. And it should be free and enjoyable to all, even for people from away. Though I could afford a fee, I'd be philosophically reluctant to ever come back to the park again if people have to pay. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Priscilla Armstrong, 18 Avon Road. I would reiterate that I am annoyed at coming back and having to talk about this within 18 months of a referendum where the town resoundingly voted against fees. I am against fees. Um, but let me be the first person to stand here and say, if the town needs additional tax revenues because they can't fulfill their obligations either to the school or to the roads or to the park, I'm willing to pay more taxes. However, I work in Portland and I walk on Baxter Boulevard, I go to the East End Beach, and I just Last Saturday, in the snowstorm, sat and watched this lovely little documentary about lighthouses in Cape Elizabeth and South Portland, the high point being the restoration of Bug Light and how proud they were of having a park where people could go for free and enjoy the restorated lighthouse, the park, and the ocean. Most of the people, according to the statistics put forth tonight, are from Maine. And I find it appalling that Cape Elizabeth, once again, will try to take an area that we got for a very reasonable fee from the federal government and charge fees. It should be free. Thank you. Thank you. Fred Prince, 2 Rocky Hill Road. At the last town meeting, as the counselors know, I talked about changing the health insurance program for the high school. The savings I estimated to be $1 million. I also had, I just want to pass this up. Would you pass this down? Sure. I myself am tired about this fight on the fork. We shouldn't be charging fees. This is a gift. This is a trust. I have an idea. Presented it three years ago, everybody laughed. Said it wasn't workable. It's not, so I'm not going to come back again on it. Close your eyes for a minute. I don't know the name of the battery. It's on the right-hand side of the lighthouse as you look at it. It's falling down, has graffiti all over it. The idea was to turn that into, a, I think it's called a crematorium, uh, in, into a place where you put urns of people who had, uh, who've died. Okay? The battery becomes a storage place for the urns. And I don't mean just throw them in there. I mean we fix it up, we make it look good. And on that curved wall, we make it like a Vietnam wall. We put the names of the people on the wall. We put a, um, what's the name of it, uh, a Kindle down in front where people can leave their last words if you want to pause through. Like, just the same as a Vietnam wall. You want to see where Harry is, you go down and find him, and that's where he is in the wall, and you can break it off. Now, I did some quick thinking on this. I called Hobbs today. The average size of one of these is 12 by 12 by 12. We put in 5,000. We charge $4,000 to get in for the first 2,000 people. That's $8 million. Charge 10,000 after that. I'm estimating we could uh, run up probably $38 million. Take away $2 million to fix that battery up. Now you have $36 million. $36 million earning 4% is a million two. What I'm suggesting is we not think about chump change and we go after some real money. We stop thinking about just trying to save $200 and we try to get this town going. 
so that we can preserve this beautiful asset that we have. Because we have a trust. We have, we, all the people who have lived here since this Ford has started have paid taxes to keep this free. I think that trust should be, should, should be carried on. We've had bad times, we've had good times, we've always done it. We need new thinking. Maybe use a battery for something else. Not, not my idea. But we need new thinking, and this is not new thinking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Prince. Herb Dennison, 63 Sperling Avenue. I say to this council, you ought to honor the people's votes. It's been less than 28 months or whatever. The people voted no fees, and yet every time you turn around, you're coming up with more fees. You've heard things tonight, and so have I, about revenues and other areas. I think you've tried to cram too much, too quick, too fast. I think that you ought to get a forum, just like you, Madam Chairman, said tonight, and you ridiculed me in front of the public, I'll ridicule you, that you were going to let each one of us talk, and then somebody else, and then the council would talk. And the other one has caused the time delay because you haven't run your council meeting right or board right. That's my personal opinion. Now to get it back to your fort. It's a nice place in town. There has been a lot of state money and federal money put into that fort in the past since the town bought it to make it a park. You have monies for trails and monies for whatever you want for other places. If the people voted no fees, I think you should honor it. You found $20,000 fast enough to put up some sonar lights for somebody that might cross 77 once a week. And I bet there was never a survey made on how many people walked that crosswalk across that street. Slow down. You, you could never get this done for this budget and done properly. And I think the people have demonstrated tonight there's plenty of other ways of raising revenue without charging fees. So you can honor the people's vote. Thank you. Thanks very much for sharing your views, sir. Next. Uh, Bill Enman, 58 Spruwick Avenue. I'm against fees. Uh, I voted before. I've been to the council meetings before, the same thing. Uh, most of the people I know, talk to, and I talk to quite a few from day to day, they're opposed to it. I think you, you say it was 28 months ago when we had this. I don't think their minds have changed a bit. And every once in a while, I hear this, uh, this uh, gorgeous building being brought up. I don't think we need to restore that. I think that's somebody's pipe dream. That was not a real historic, uh, have any real significant uh, uh, contribution to this town. I think the lighthouse is the attraction, not the burned out facility that now stands over there. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Next, I can't see who's, oh, thank you. Harry Hardy, 6 Charles Road, and just up front I should tell you, I am a park ranger down there, and I am speaking as a citizen. I'm not speaking as a park ranger. I've been in town 38 years. My wife's been here all her life, so I am going to speak. Uh, when they, I thought we had put the issue of, of fees to rest a couple of years ago when we voted. Apparently, that's not the case. Uh, so I would just the one thing I guess guess I need to say: you hear a lot of rumors, and you hear about how they're going to implement these fees. Be very careful what you do, and try to remember, if you do decide you're going to charge a fee, that it isn't how much money you take in or how much money you handle, it's how much money you keep at the end. And some of these things that I've heard, and I haven't heard anything official, but some of these things I've heard I think are going to be very expensive to impl implement, and, and I think you need to, you know, to consider that very carefully. And uh, so I can't speak as a ranger, but if anybody on the council has any questions, 
uh, you know, I'd be glad to give my thoughts. I have some very strong thoughts about it, but I have to keep it to myself. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Hardy. Somebody, I can't see where it's gone. Uh, oh. I was a TV viewer. Um, <laughs> I was wondering, I mentioned excuse, it. Excuse oh, me. Oh, Carl Dittrich, 500 Ocean House, Tropical Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Um, the Beach to Beacon, which sells out in 48 hours, which some of the Cape residents get shouted out of, um, cost $35. If the fee was raised to $50, I still think the 5,500 people would come. $15 could go right to the Fort Williams. That'd be what, 75 grand. This year, boom, just like that. Another thought was, because at the very beginning of this, you asked for ideas of how to really make money. Um, maybe a, I was watching the, base, the hockey game, and James Taylor came on. Maybe we could get a national semi-nice act thought, you know, where the town was guaranteed. It was run by an outside company, professionally, where the town would be guaranteed $50,000, $60,000 for 500 to 1,000 people paying 50 to 75 dollars to see a James Taylor concert at Fort Williams, something like that. Um, my wife heard someone ask about food, and the town manager didn't, there was no specific answer. Can we sell food, the, the headlight hot dog, the bag of chips, the Coke, and the Sprite, in a roped off area with one napkin, one trash barrel, asking the people, do not move from there. <laughs> And I think they would. <laughs> and believe it or not, I think people from the town would, would love to go up there and have something to eat. In the summertime, I know they, you know, they do the five or six hundred grand at the little gift shop. At my little house, you know, they ask four questions. Where can I get a lobster? Where can I stay? Where's Portland Hyde Light? And how much of the little house is on the water? I have no good answer for the where can you stay or where can you get a lobster roll. Um, I've sent them down to the lobster shack numerous times, but they get logger jammed down there. People have come in my driveway sweating because they, they, they've gone down there in a motor home and it's, it's a nightmare. Um, someone mentioned the park is huge. The park is huge. Um, couldn't it be off in a little separate area? If, if the town doesn't want to do it, if you put the ad in the paper for Portland vendors, if, the, if you had to get your application done on a Monday, they would be lined up on a Friday. To have the rights to Fort Williams would be fine. Maybe you don't even see it. There's just one little sign, food, up this way, and you've got you to gotta walk up there. It's, you know, it's not even a water view, something like that. But like they said, we've already discussed it. They voted 62%, 38%, whatever it was. It's our gift to the world. And that's that. Thanks very much. Yeah, can I, Is there anybody else who I'd like to speak as hasn't a, spoken? Me, as a citizen. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you haven't spoken as okay. a citizen. I don't We're know where the mic. The 16 stunning for growth. Oh, um, sorry. I just, you know, I've heard a lot of comments about um, another commission or another board or you know somebody to study what we could do for you know vendors. You know, I, and I never realized a lot of the things that happened in this town prior to being on the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. There are commissions and boards that are in place to do certain things. There's the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, which is out there to help earn money for the fort. I just, I grow concerned when I hear about adding more boards, more commissions on top of commissions that have already been appointed or charitable foundations that have already been instituted. I just would really urge everybody to start reading the minutes of you know, the Library Fund, the Fort Williams Charitable Foundation, the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, none of this is done behind closed doors. It's all available for the public to read. It's out on the website. And I urge people to become participants in reading and commenting about what's going on in our town. That's it. Okay. Is there anybody else, any other citizen who hasn't spoken? Okay. Yes, but, but, please, but please go to the microphone. I've heard it said numerous times. That and could you state your name? I'm Bill Nickerson again. <laughs> Thank um, you. Numerous times that there are a million or more visitors to the fort each year. 
and I've never known where that number comes from. Um, one of the things that was done in this Council of Government study was on the four days that cars came in, they counted the number of occupants in each car, and the average was 2.2. So if we're projecting 190,000 cars a year, um, you know, so we're up around 400,000. If you, if you um, say it's 250, 250,000 because our estimate is conservative, it's still only slightly more than a half a million people a year that come into Fort Williams. And I think, I think it's important to not have numbers out there that don't have some basis in fact. And these may not be the most perfect numbers, but they're better, I think, than they're, they're, there's, I've never seen where the million dollars or the million uh, visitors a year came from. And at least this gives us a little bit of a foundation upon which to make some judgments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill, for clarifying that. Um, Given that no one else who has already spoken seems to want to speak at this point, and is there any counselor that hasn't spoken that wants to speak or ask questions? Okay. Um, and given that it is 9.25 and the uh, council has another topic on our workshop agenda tonight, um, I think I want to thank everybody who's participated tonight uh, in this exchange of ideas. It was sort of an experimental format and I know we ran a little long but I think it was, I personally think it was worth it because I think we got a lot of good input from everybody. I really appreciate your time and your ideas and your courtesy to each other and uh, thank you very much and we will move forward with this process and mush around everything we've heard and uh, we'll work further on this and see where it takes us. So thank you very much.
Okay, councillors and whoever else is here, we're on the Finance Committee review of the Municipal Budget Update, and um, Sarah's, Sarah's stepped out for just a second, but uh, Mike will clue us in on this. Mike, we're still on air, so you may want to go to a microphone. Okay, I'll do that. Fine. Thank you. One, you want me to go ahead? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, one of the council goals every year is to look at look quarterly at, at the municipal finances. And I apologize for not getting this to you today, but even when I left work today, I still haven't gotten the monthly financial statements uh, from the official source. These were ones I just uh, ran off uh, at the computer. Can you guys hear okay? A lot of background noise. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah, that'd be great, David. I'll, Thank you, I'll suspend for a minute until he comes back. Yeah, we'll just wait till the door is shut so we can hear. It's disconcerting. It's, yeah, a little distracting. But that's okay. People are leaving. Oops, oh, sorry. Thanks, David. Anyway, what, 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 what I was saying, Ann? Yes. Am I... On? Yes, the, the, I'm sorry, the technical guy is waving at me and I don't know what he's saying. He's saying, can you turn that? I think we're still on. Yes, if you're, if you're asking if you can turn that mic off, yes, you can. <laughs> anyway, you know, I apologize for not getting this to you sooner. This, unfortunately, this workshop is the first work day of the new year, so as a result, uh, it, was, it was difficult to get everything in place. But what I really want to focus on is where we stand with revenues, because this is the, the driving force of a lot that goes on. And if you look at the, about the middle of the sheet, there's, there's a, see near the bottom, there's an amount that says 3.152. See that one, 500? Yes. You, what's really important, I think, is the number next to that, the minus 224,975. If you look at the heading of that column, these are the municipal revenues other than the property tax. And in the last six months of fiscal year, well, excuse me, the first six months of fiscal year 08, this would be July to December of 07. Uh, compared to the most recent six months that just ended last week, we took in $224,975 less than we took in in that same period two years before. So these are actual? These are actual numbers. Okay. And, you know, it goes back to, you know, some of the conversations that we just had at the workshop, nothing's changed in two years. You know, I, we, you know, there can be debate that whether or not you want to fees, but you know, you look at these numbers and it just tells you a different story. Uh, this is out of revenues thus far of the fiscal year. In FY 2008, it was 2067. So we've lost more than 10% of our non-property tax revenues just on the municipal side of the government. Uh, you know, and this doesn't exclude, include looking at the schools with the state school subsidy over the, the two and a half, three year period, if you look at the, and it's tough to call the projections, but you know, they're looking at about a $2 million difference. So, and if, if you annualize this 224, you know, that's, a, that's over, you know, about $450,000 over the course of a year. So, you know, it, it's, you know, the, the, these are real declines in revenue, you know, met at a time when, you know, most of the expenses, you know, if it wasn't for doing some of the, the courageous decisions the council did this past year, you know, we'd, we'd be in really tough shape. The variance from last year, the, the last six months of 08, the first six months of fiscal year 09, is 107,505. So what, it, what this shows is that we have lost, you know, almost about the same amount of revenue equally in the last two years. We've, we're down about $110,000 in each of the two years, 110,000 less the first year and 110,000 more or less the second year. I think those are real key numbers. As you look up above, particularly from the FY10, that same column with 107,000, you look up above and you can see excise taxes were down 18,000 for the year. Investment income, lower interest rates compared to a year ago, were down 43,000. State revenue sharing, we're down 16,700. And the other, the other one that really concerns me is this pool revenue amount. And, you know, we're down 37,875. But what's really significant, you look at those next two columns, percentage of budget achieved. I know Frank from, you know, past emails focuses on this, you know, to see if we're 
we're estimating revenues properly or whatever. You look at this time last fiscal year on these revenues, we had taken in 56.5% of our revenues. The comparative year to date as a percentage of budget is 58.4, which means we're doing better in relation to budget than we were a year ago. Can you follow that? And you look up, up above there and you can see all the different numbers and whatever. The next column, FY10 projection, this is based on looking at the previous two columns, looking at where we ended up at the ends of those last fiscal years, and looking at the, the governor's recent announcement, pronouncement on further curtailing revenue sharing, which you know, brings it down to 548. And what this shows, and, and, and I have to say, I put all the individual numbers in, and then only then I did the, the sum. So it, it wasn't you know, aiming for a certain number or target. And if you look at that, if you look at, for the non-property tax revenues, we were projected to be at 3,142,500 for the fiscal year in total. Right now, we're projecting we're going to come exactly on target with revenues at the end of the fiscal year. We also have, and this last number is really fudgy because I'm not too, too sure where Matt's going to stand. I haven't had discussions with him in the last few days, but there's still some potential abatements for some properties that are, that are a bit out of whack. Uh, but I'm estimating an overlay, 97800 That's monies that weren't budgeted, that the tax rate was set higher than, we, than you know, in the end we needed. It's because the, there was more valuation overall than the budget predicated. So I'm estimating that. So this shows that when the fiscal year is complete, our revenues with all of these ongoing revenues, we expect to be at 100% of budget exactly. And that if you add the overlay, we'll exceed the budgeted revenues by 103%. Any questions? By, by, by 3%. Three, by 3%. <laughs> 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 Which is, I'm sorry. Shoot. I'm glad you're, I'd like to say I was testing if you're awake, but I know better. Uh, you know, the other issue we have is, you know, property tax. Wait, wait Mike. Yep. He's going too fast for me. So can you backtrack to the sentence you made a couple where you basically you read us as saying the fire and death report and then you're like, but this is great because we're coming out exactly where we projected and everything's yeah. fine. I missed the leap there. Why, why are we fine given that everything's down? Why are we what? Why is it coming out exactly how we projected? We estimated, because we estimated it would we be We estimated down. well. We knew it would go yeah. down. The budget reduced what? revenues and the budget, you know, there's a lot of ups and downs in different categories, but the numbers show that it all nets out so that we expect to meet budget almost exactly on revenue. So you didn't predict by category or anything, it just happened, you just predicted conservatively and everything and... Well, as it turns out, some things I, I did conservatively and some I did liberally. You know, I overestimated revenue sharing based on what's happened. You know, we're only going to get 89% of that. But the one that really worries me is the pool. Because Do you know pool, why? Can you speculate why that is? I, you know, have they not brought in money the last... You know, I don't know. I, you know, I need to, it's, I only, I actually, I, I began to look at the numbers before I had the final numbers, uh, you know, last week before the holidays, and I usually don't bug staff over Jim. the holidays, no, but it's a concern. They eliminated the dis, the employee discount. So you have a lot of people, teachers, yeah. who did not take their <coughs> because mm. I swim there every day, and there yeah. are less of them, because I just signed up for my yeah. pool membership today. Yeah. It's no longer a volunteer or yep. a, a, an employee discount of 20%. Now that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but mm -hmm. a $300 mm -hmm. per year mm -hmm. membership, that adds up to some serious yep. dollars. So there are less memberships yeah. we, we have when, it, when it comes time for budget, maybe we could get some more precise information yeah, about what's happened to memberships and stuff. Just the membership versus the uh, price differential. Is that, I would think that the the walk-in folks on the weekends might be going up because with the poor economy, that's a pretty Cheaper. cheap way to spend two or three hours to entertain your children. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you, again, you look at the two-year cycle on pool revenues. We, we only took an $8,000 hit the first year from the year before. We're taking a $38,000 hit from last year to this year. So while it's 44000 less than two years ago, 
thirty-eight thousand of that is is this year. So something. If you could investigate, yeah, I, I need or to investigate have it. Somebody investigate that. Yeah. Can I, I make a? I tried to bold the numbers. I think that have some significance here. If you notice, Sarah I, has I, a question. I, I just have a suggestion when you yeah. look into this. One of the aspects I think you should look into are designated hours for various. Um, I don't know what you call it, constituents, because I happen to live with a person who works and tries to get in swimming laps, who's highly yeah. discontent with, because he thinks he gets so squeezed. It's, it's basically the people paying the full rate, freight that end up having a half an hour after work before the whole night that comes in, because yeah. they favor the specialty things, the this, the that, the open swims. So I, I think yeah. what I'm suggesting is people may be discontent enough so that they're actually going to other pools in nearby communities because there's virtually no time for the working athlete to swim. So I would, I'm just saying it'd be worth asking the person in charge of it how they decide on time allocations. I'm just raising it as something that needs focus and attention. I don't, I don't yeah. know what the answers are yet. Frank. Community services? Yeah. Community services, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, but it's, but it's, it's, it's a weird, it's, it falls back it's onto town, me rather than on the superintendent. It's a town pool. facility, mm -hmm. yeah. but it's, it's sort of... Janet Hoskin it, it's, supervises It's a perfect example of the one-town concept. Yeah. It so. sort of isn't working for what it's worth. He's emailed, because he yells at me. I tell him to email Janet <laughs> and... and whether being she, he hasn't heard back. So he's it, welcome I, to email me as well. I should have emailed you. Yeah. I'm just saying that I think other everyone thinks maybe someone else does hours or I don't know. I'm not it, faulting anybody. It's just clearly sure something support. is awry there. Okay. Well, Mike will follow up and get us right. information. Are there other questions for Mike? Uh, question about the overlay. Yeah. You, you mentioned that you haven't connected with Matt. Yes. Um, what might be vacants? Yes. That are in the pipeline yeah. Yeah. There's not usually supplements during the year. It's that's usually an error found in assessment. You, you, yeah, you, you you assess taxes once a year based on the value of, as of April one. You know the, the properties, for example. You know people say, what's that big house on whatever street going to pay for taxes? You know what happens is Matt goes there on or about April one and you know adds it all up and determines the value. There's there's really only one year. Opportunity, but there are there are some there's a few other issues that that I know he's been focused on, and I don't want to publicly say, you know, what they are because that, I don't this, know if he's talked to any of the residents. But, but this projection is 970. That's that's a conservative. You know, if, if the total overlay for this year, I believe, is about 170 thousand. The total overlay. This is there's a hundred of it that I'm estimating that even when he is completely done with his work, that will be Lisa. And I don't, you know, this is, again, I, you know, this was something that I, because of the way the fiscal year fell the calendar and you were meeting on the fourth day of the month, I didn't have as much time to analyze. Is, I, I threw, that's a placeholder, but it, I think it's at least that. Frank. Like, how did you, um, given what you knew about the first six months of the year, how did you adjust the forecast for the remaining six months? Were they the original numbers plus the actuals of the first six months? It was looking at what we usually earn in the last six months. Particularly, I spend more time on the the more major revenues. I, I, I look at what the total actuals were. For example, Turks fees. You know, right now it's only 35 percent. It looks low, but we did an analysis and we show we showed we actually make more money from dog late fees than we do from dog fees. Uh, and all that money comes in the second half of the year. Yeah. <laughs> January and February are really tough months historically for motor vehicle registrations. You know, those months are low months. So this is actually looking at what we traditionally are, particularly in the big revenues I spent time. So for example, an excise tax, which comes from sale, basically sale a lot of new cars, right? That says and, and the reduced rates and the right. used ones. So we could have had a pump up during the uh, incentive Clunk, period. The clunker period. Right which may not follow through or may actually decline in the second half of yeah. the year. Did you, how did you factor that in? We, I, I looked at that some and I, you know, we're still going to get the cars that were bought a year ago during some good incentives. In, they paid 2.4% last year. They'll still be paying 2.1% this year. And, and the other thing is, you know, they're going to continue, if people aren't buying cars, they're going to continue to have incentives for people to buy them. And eventually, people are going to have to buy cars. But our, our other issue is we think, but we don't know uh, categorically, what's the word? We don't know definitely. People seem to be buying 
less expensive cars now. Mm -hmm. trading. With trading, they're not getting the cars with all the souped up features. Right. Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And on the, um, on the investment income, does that capture, is it, does some, does that capture some of the premium? Uh, related to the, re the uh, refinancing we did? Or is uh, no, that would be on the expenditure side of savings. Okay. So you just have low yeah. expectations, in a sense, for interest income we would have. Yeah. The, I, I'm still, on the expenditure side, I'm still estimating, you know, it's about $100,000 savings we're going to have in debt service, which includes the premium plus the debt service savings. Other questions for Mike on revenues? Oh. Jessica. What it is over? Overlay is, is that when the budget's put together, there is, is a, there's an estimate of what all of the taxable value in the property is going to be worth. Mm -hmm. This past year, it was $1,335,000. The actual valuation was one million three forty five zero 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 zero. So it was $10 million more. You multiply 10 million divided by 1,000 times the tax rate of 1744, and you come out with the 17 whatever. But then there's another little factor there that the tax rate actually ended up a penny less than the council had adopted during the budget process because we wanted to round it down to an even number uh, for reasons I won't go into tonight. So, but, but that's what overlay is. Like next year's budget, we've tried to get into the pattern, and it saved us the last couple of years from financial. Uh, distress. We've tried to do it a year in arrears, which creates an overlay each year of the amount of growth that occurs in that year. Obviously, that's something with, that's going to be challenged you know, during the budget process this year, is to see whether or not we ought to be continuing to do that. Can you, have you got that, Jessica? Yep, but I'll, you know what I'll yep. do? I'll, I'll uh, meet with you. Good. I don't and, want to take yeah, more time. Matt, once a year, Sturgis puts together a report on the on all of the assessments, and we don't have that yet. So we, I'll speak to him tomorrow. I'm not sure why we haven't gotten it yet, but we'll try to get that. Sarah, are you confident that this state, what we get from the state, is now we can rely yeah, pretty, on it? Or I'm they pretty gonna... confident. Yeah. For state revenue sharing? Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty confident. That's good. I'm glad you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Any other questions on revenues, Mike? Is there anything you want to say about revenue sharing, excise tax? You've already talked about excise no. tax. No. Museum at Portland had like gift shops. Sales. Yeah, Frank, you can see on that next sheet you asked about X. I, I put the excise tax sheet there in particular. And you, you can see, for example, you know, we have a target, which is what the budget is for every month. Right now, excise tax is running 55000 above the target. And if you look at the, the budget estimate, um, at the end of the year, I've got about 30000 above the target. So I'm ex but you look last, we had some good months there, we had the clunker months, and this answers your question. I'm, I'm expecting that that might reverse itself a little because we're not going to have the clunker months over the next few months. The estate revenue sharing, you know, that again, that's running 34000 ahead, but that's, Before but the governor's, the, the last news. estimate says we're going to get 547000 Okay. Dollars. How about Museum of Portland had like gift you know, sales? This is, I, you know, we we did peak sales one year of 508,000. We dropped 50,000 last year as a result of, you know, these tour buses. They're just people aren't spending as much when they they come. Uh, you know, and a lot of that depends on the weather and other issues. But but basically, if you if you really studied the sheet month by month, you can see when the recession hit back in you know the fall of two two years ago, when it began to hit, and you know our sales are down 50,000. So in, you know, if we look at you know, how much was transferred in to help fund things in Fort Williams, you know, this, this, is a, this was a resource that is not there now with the current policies and practices to the extent that it was, you know, the money's not going to be there to the Portland Headlight Trustees to keep enabling improvements uh, right. within the fort. Is there much of a fixed cost component to running that gift shop? There is. What, what, what is it? Yeah, we have another sheet that we put out that show all the operations. I'll, I'll email it to you. But we have, we have paid staff. You do, okay. Yeah, we also have the, the operation of the lighthouse itself. It needs to be painted every two or three years. Okay, that's it's the heave. It's the, there's a public works. We charge off 
Uh, I think one of the ranges is totally Portland headlights, some of the portable toilets we charge off the Portland headlight. It's just looking um, at their results historically, their margins have the eroded remarkably. Yeah. I mean, down Jim's got it too. No, I've got it right here. Yeah. I just screwed it. They were at the Yeah, the, the exact numbers too are in in the document that I handed out tonight yeah. on page 17, which is the last sheet in fact. The last sheet of this packet. You can see where the total budget is 530000 of which 265000 is to purchase the goods to sell in the gift shop. Right. And the rest of it is for payroll, printing and advertising, the marketing cards we do, building maintenance, grounds maintenance, and insurances, and museum development, and the rest of it. Any other questions on revenues? <clears throat> Mike? On expenses, I, I haven't had a chance yeah, to look at Expenses I can make really quick. Yeah, what do you want? You know, there is almost nothing to report. That, that's at all unusual, with the one exception of the debt service savings. We anticipate about 100,000 savings there. You know, the energy costs are usually variable. We locked them in early. We knew the budget price locked in. The degree days are about where we expected them to be. Uh, workers' comp just came in. Uh, that should be five to 10,000 less than we anticipated. Uh, health insurance uh, came in a little over 7%. That was about a percent more than we anticipated. But overall, the expenditures, you know, I'm guessing it'll be like most years, we'll probably hit, you know, 99% of the, the budgeted amount. Uh, pretty confident we won't go over it. But, you know, and particularly as we, you know, as the budget's been cut this past year, the past few years, you know, we've, we've nickel and dimed a lot of those accounts, you know, looking at the actuals over the past few years, and there just isn't going to be the, the, uh, the savings in a lot of those areas. So, you know, we, we, there were emails this weekend about winter storms, and, you know, you can, you can see that, you know, we took an approach that, you know, we tried to manage the storm using the procedures we've always used. We don't try to keep the roads bare all during the storm. But we do salt them, you know, from time to time, and you know, uh, I think that system worked fairly well. It was only one citizen, right? It was only one citizen. Okay, I just want to yeah. be clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> but one whose opinion I value. Well, I do too, but it wasn't this overflow of it, emails, it, and I, I it heard gave no a good complaints from no to one. Respond. Um, are there any other questions on this quarterly? I think they did a great review. job. Really. I did too. Yeah. I had the exact opposite reaction from that emailer. Okay. Yeah. Okay. No more questions for Mike on this. Yeah, uh, on this. this. If anyone has any questions, please, you know, please take the time to look at this, and uh, uh, you know we'll be meeting again next Monday, or you can email them. We do have a workshop next Monday at seven. Yeah. Uh, half hour before the council meeting to talk about goals a little bit. So yeah. Goal assignments. So half an hour, and then the council meeting at 7:30. And um, if we just have scheduling or whatever else to deal with, I, I do. It's almost 10 o'clock. I want to let our poor tech guy go. If if tech our guys. workshop is done, is our workshop done? Okay. Thank you, Jason or whoever. Uh, sure. You can turn off the mics.